So my name's Stephanie. I do sensory interior design. That's designing for people with sensory sensitivities. And a lot of people who have sensory sensitivities have brains that I would call neurodiverse. Neurodiversity is a difference in how your brain is organized and how it processes stimuli. It's not necessarily a disability. It's often billed as that. A lot of people who count as neurodiverse are on the autism spectrum. A lot of them have ADHD, sensory processing disorder, which is a pejorative term that I don't necessarily like, but that's how it's termed. And then there are people with high sensitivity that are not necessarily sensitive enough to be to qualify as any kind of a disorder, but still process sensory stimuli differently or more intensely than other people. Um, there's also some overlap among these conditions. So you can be on the spectrum and have sensory processing disorder. You can have sensory processing disorder and not necessarily be qualified as being on the autism spectrum. But these are kind of vague and fungible terms that we're learning a lot more about in cognitive neurology at the moment. These statistics in terms of percentages of population are from the CDC as of 2018. The CDC gets these statistics in terms of how many eight-year-olds are currently diagnosed with ADHD or autism spectrum that does not include adults. The reason for that is that they've only recently started diagnosing people as on the autism spectrum in a routine way. A lot of adults don't realize that they might be on the spectrum until their child is diagnosed. And then the light bulb goes on, they're like, wow, <laughs> this could explain a lot. Sensory sensitivity can also be exacerbated by things that are acquired, like trauma. PTSD can, can alter your degree of sensitivity. Acquired neurological diseases like MS and chronic pain, which we're now starting to understand as a brain dysfunction, can also alter your sensitivity. So designing for sensitivity encompasses quite a large percentage of the population when you factor in all of these things. The statistic here for just ordinary sens sensory sensitivity comes from a book called The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine Aaron. It was written in the late 90s. She started defining and noticing this trait that about 20% of the population are just more highly keyed. They, they take in more information, all kinds of information, and it affects their ability to deal with being in a physical environment. I see some people, I see some heads nodding. I, you know, a lot of people have this and we don't really identify it as such. We just know that lots of situations stress us out in ways that don't seem to apply to a lot of other people. So I don't mean to insult anybody by my use of visual metaphors for the neurotypical or neurodiverse brain. This is a general concept. I think the important thing to understand is that a neurotypical person, most of the processing you're doing of stuff that comes in is going on in your back end. It's intuitive. It's not happening in your conscious mind, which makes it really easy to focus, your decision making is largely intuitive because your ranking of hierarchies is automatic. You know what's important because you have a purpose and it's all just going on back there without any conscious attention on your part. You're also pretty resilient. If you get knocked off focus, you know, all the back end is like, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna pick it up where we left off, we're just gonna go ahead. Someone on the autism spectrum or someone with ADHD 
is getting a lot more types of input into their conscious mind that they cannot filter out. They're getting granular data that doesn't necessarily automatically integrate. This means that everything that's happening in your conscious mind, you don't necessarily know which things are important to pay attention to or important in terms of what other people think is important. It also means that you get very easily overwhelmed by stimulation, both by sensory stimulation and emotional stimulation. If you're a child, this means you have meltdowns at inappropriate times or that are inappropriate for the adults around you. If you're an adult, this can mean that you have a really difficult time making decisions because your brain doesn't automatically focus on timelines or priorities or hierarchy. You can get easily distracted by something that a neurotyp neurotypical person is going to think is totally irrelevant. There's also evidence to suggest that this makes emotional processing more difficult and slower for someone who's neurodiverse. That because it's all cranking through your conscious mind, it's not necessarily intuitive, you've got to actually power through that. You're not going to be, have a naturally you know, time-appropriate empathic response. This does not mean that neurodiverse people lack empathy or that they lack feelings. It means that those feelings are getting processed in a different way and that it's slower and more difficult. Neurodiversity has some compensations. Neurodiverse people, a lot of them have superpowers. I have a lot of friends on the spectrum and I have noticed that that famed hyperfocus can lead people to accomplish some pretty amazing things in a lot of different fields. Your interests are not related to your brain function. So there are people on the spectrum in all fields. In technology, that kind of hyperfocus can lead you to become an excellent hacker or an excellent systems designer. And the way the world is going, the world needs a lot of hackers. We're behind Russia in terms of our hacker capability. We need a lot of counterintelligence hackers. And it seems to be true that people with neurodiverse brains are naturally suited to that kind of work. In society, I know a lot of artists, a lot of designers, a lot of alternative healers who are neurodiverse. It gives them different perspective, different insight, and a focus on problems that a lot of us are really good at shutting out, but that are really important for our survival as a species. And in design, I have known people who were on the spectrum that had such good spatial visualization capacities that they broke every test that they were given. So all of that different brain organization, when it's harnessed, and importantly, when people can function, can be an amazing tool for solving problems. If a, if a neurodiverse person is unemployable because they can't function in an environment, that is a huge loss, not just for them, but for all of us. So this is a personal and passionate cause for me, that if neurodiversity is understood in the design phase of any kind of a space, you are enabling so much more good to come out of any project that you undertake. So sensory accessibility. When we talk about physical accessibility. We're talking about a set of codes from the ADA, from, from the American Disabilities Act, which make it make a space physically accessible to someone with mobility issues. We're talking ramps, we're talking clearances. It's a pretty cut and dry code. With neurodiversity, we're talking functional access. If you are on the spectrum, 
if you can physically get into a space, it is not accessible to you if it is so chaotic that you can't think, make a decision, interact with a person, have a conversation. It's functionally inaccessible. This is a little more complicated because everyone who is neurodiverse is different. You have different triggers, you have different needs, different levels of sensitivity, which means it's not as easy to create a simple code which makes a space sensory accessible. It's a process. It's a process of analyzing what needs to happen in that space, who is gonna be in that space, what they're gonna be doing, and what kind of a of a vibe you want to create. Do you want it to be calming? Do you want it to be exciting? However, there are some guiding principles which you can use to decide how sensory accessible or why you want the space to be sensory accessible. So I'll take you through those right now. First overarching principle, mitigate the chaos. This is usually happening when you are trying to retrofit or renovate a space so that sensory sensitive people can function a little bit better. The thing about sensory sensitivity is that because your brain is so easily distracted, any kind of question or clutter is going to be a problem. A lot of people assume that intense stimulation is a problem, that's not necessarily true. It's more that misaligned stimulation is a problem. Movie theaters are fabulous sensory spaces because all of it's all black around you and all of your attention is just channeled to that one space to the screen. And so there's, there aren't any decisions that you have to make. You know, when I was in Times Square in a state of like complete overwhelm, the only thing I could do was duck into a movie theater and I just felt my nervous system just, oh, thank God, you know, it was a really, you know, it was an intense movie, but at least it was all one thing. This is a, an, a, an image painted by an artist who self-diagnosed as on the spectrum after her daughter was diagnosed as being on the spectrum. And I chose it because I think it kind of gives you a feeling about what it's like to have that kind of intense sensory sensitivity, that it's a, it's a large oil painting. The colors are intense and the observation is intense and every detail is equally weighted, equally intensely rendered. It's like her brain is taking in every little granular bit and there is no differentiation about what is more important. So essentially, you want to create a space that's aligned. You want it to be obvious what's going to happen in there and to, and, to, and to take away any extraneous detail that's not really important to the process that's going to be happening in there. Acoustics. This is the biggest problem, particularly in 2019, when all the restaurants are converted warehouse with no sound mitigation whatsoever. Reverb is incredibly painful. High decibels, noise bleed. You, you absolutely, I can't go into Martha and, and have a conversation with a friend without coming out of there completely drained and frazzled. Someone on the spectrum, it's going to be essentially no go. If you have an office space, with low cubicles and you have noise bleed, you can hear the conversation next door. That's going to make someone who's sensitive, who's on the spectrum, almost impossible to focus and concentrate. If you have a space where people need to be focused or resting, like taking an exam, for example, even something like a ticking clock or a water drip or an HVAC hum is going to make it torture for some people. So some spaces you're going to need to have them as soundproofed as possible and even do things like take the clocks out. There are a lot of different options for mitigating sound in your environment. There's some amazing high-tech solutions. There's 
there are generators, white noise generators, pink noise generators, reverb, that kind of thing that you can use to control the sound. And you can also do really low tech things. Just putting down a carpet, draping some fabric over the ceiling, wallpaper, curtains, anything that's gonna absorb sound, any sort of like decorative thing that's gonna bounce sound waves in a, in a funky way so that they're not as, as coherent and thus loud is gonna help. Lighting is a close second in terms of being sensor, sensory accessible. Cheap lighting is generally horrible, unfortunately. Bar fluorescent lights, can light. I talked to um, a therapist that says it's his can light in his office is a really good diagnostic for kids because they're like, they, they can't look away from that can light. It's, it's just too intense. Those bodegas with those LEDs that flicker, that can produce seizures in someone who's neurosensitive. It's just, it's, it's horrible. So when you're doing lighting design for a sensory space, you want to think about ways that you can bounce lighting off of reflective surfaces. You don't want a concentrated spot. You want it to be indirect. You want it to be reflected and like, and also, lots of little low wattage bulbs is a lot better than one high intensity bulb. You want to be able to control how much light at any time. And um, you want to be, people to be able to control their personal workstations. You know, if they have a lamp which is going to get them some light, it's better than having a really bright overhead light that's going to, like, you know, freak some people out. Texture is one of those things that you hardly notice unless you're sensitive. There are some neurosensitive people who cannot sit on a rigid chair for more than five or ten minutes because it just becomes unendurable. Fabric coverings can be a lifesaver for people on the spectrum. Fabric can also be a real double whammy in terms of reducing reverb. So when you're designing a space that needs to be sensory accessible, you want to pay a lot of attention to your coverings and keep, you know, clothing. If you're, um, lots of people can't deal with, with tags or your fabric content. So you want to, um, you want to take that into consideration when you're doing a design for that. I define grounding as a really obvious sense of spatial orientation in regards to gravity. This is something that a neurotypical person takes completely for granted. We know which way is up and we trust that the ground is holding us up. For some people with a lot of sensitivity, that is not obvious at all. I'm a massage therapist and I've had people on my table that are like this and I'll say, the earth is holding you up. And they're like, really? People on the spectrum and even neurotypical people can really benefit from a strong sense of where the ground is. This is why weighted blankets do a lot to calm anxiety and overwhelm. People on the spectrum can also benefit from weighted chairs, literally a chair that's built like a bowling ball with a lot of weight, like a deep armchair or something with, that, that really orients you and you can sink into and you're like, okay, here I am. Enclosed spaces, even like, you know, almost like a straight jacket, but even a space that's like a niche that's, that's dark or has little twinkle lights can do a whole lot to calm someone down who's in a state of sensory overwhelm. You can do a little alcove. Uh, kids on the spectrum can like have a little tent in their room. Basically any kind of like little cocoon space where you can just feel like you know where you are. There's something touching you and there's this gravity and you feel weighted down. That's gonna help deal with sensory overwhelm. Emotional privacy is another consideration when you're creating those niches. As I said, people on the spectrum are not emotionally dead. 
that they get easily emotionally overwhelmed. So if you're in a space where you don't have to make eye contact because you because it's all closed in, that can escalate that can take down your overwhelm and make you more able to process things. And creating a little niche like this can be a real simple fix for a large institutional space where you can't necessarily redesign the whole thing to you know, lower the ceiling height or anything, but if you can just organize just some kind of little space where people can just like, you know, just a little corner, that can really, really help. Air quality. We all have someone in the office that can't deal with perfume. There is a huge subset of people, me being one of them, who cannot walk into a Yankee candle store who cannot walk down the detergent aisle at the supermarket. Strong and particularly synthetic odors can be completely incapacitating for a pretty big range of sensitive people. Wind and drafts and abrupt, te abrupt temperature changes, same difference. Everybody's bothered by these things. People who are sensitive are just a lot more bothered and not, won't necessarily be able to focus if there's a high temperature or a high draft in the space. Um, this is a healthy building issue. You've all heard about sick building syndrome. People who are sensitive are just like the canaries in the coal mine. If someone's complaining that there's a bad smell in the space and 90% of the people can't smell it, you still need to pay attention to that one person because it's affecting everyone's health, whether or not you're consciously aware of it. This means you need to make sure your air is filtered. You may need to make sure you have good ventilation. And integrating plants can be a really cheap, low-tech way to filter your air and basically make it more of a habitat that's going to be conducive to life. If your plant's dying, it's probably not too good for you either. Which brings me to my favorite principle, which is that there's a massive amount of overlap in terms of a design that is environmentally sustainable and sensory accessible. A sensory sensitive person is, as I said, our canary in the coal mine for our entire species. If we're designing with sensory sensitivity in mind, we're automatically fixing a lot of problems that are going to be a problem for all of us in the longer term. So a lot of the principles that I have talked about in the previous slides, if you're applying those and you're talking with a sustainable person, you can solve a lot of problems all at once and boost the health of your entire environment. This is particularly important on an institutional level because we're talking about healthcare costs, we're talking about mental health care, we're talking about dealing with people with PTSD. If you have an environment that is not sustainable or sensory accessible, that is supposed to be a healing environment like a hospital, you're pushing the brakes and the accelerator at the same time. If you're in an environment which is causing your nervous system to go into high adrenaline overload, you're working against the healing process. So doing some basic sensory and sustainable analysis in the design phase of any kind of institutional project is going to have really long-term results on a societal level, on an economic level, on a healthcare level, and basically even on a global warming level, if we start to think about these things all at once. So your friend with the autism spectrum is there to help you. <laughs> They're not an inconvenience. We need to start thinking about neurosensitivity as something that's important to process as an entire society, and particularly as design professionals. 
So the sensory design process is different depending on the context. When I'm designing for a private home, it gets incredibly specific. We sit down, we talk about the specific sensitivities of who's going to be living there, what they need to do, their particular sound needs, their light needs, their color needs. And it's a very, very personal process. If you're designing your office to be sensory accessible, there's going to need to be a conversation both with your employees who are sensitive and with everybody else. The people with sensitivities, you need to sit and talk about what's your trigger, what do you need, what's, you know, what's going to bother you. And you also need to talk with everybody else so that they're not seeing this as an annoyance or that someone's just being, oh, you're just too sensitive, you need to get over it. You need to build an awareness about what this is and that it's not just someone being a princess or, you know, trying to control things, that it's really important. And then you need to make the adjustments necessary for whoever's going to be working for you. On an institutional level, as I said, I think it's vitally important that as a society, we start paying attention to this. Our educational institutions, I've talked to teachers that say, a first grade classroom, it's overwhelming for 60% of the kids. Like our assumptions about what a child needs are really skewed. You know, our classrooms are traumatizing a lot of kids just because they're too chaotic. As I said, healthcare, hugely important. Any kind of government building, any kind of museum, you need a space where people can go and recharge. You're going to make everybody's life so much easier. You're going to have fewer people having meltdowns, fewer people yelling at your customer service representatives. You're going to have less stressed out employees. It may seem like an annoying luxury to design this way, but it's going to have a really big return on your investment. So to start this process, I created a little e-course called the Eccentric Genius Habitat Intervention. It's just eight days of emails which help you start taking yourself through analyzing your own sensitivities as it relates to your own environment. A lot of things are going to be obvious. A lot of things, maybe you're like, whoa, I didn't realize that. And you'll start to be able to think that way, that you're aware of every single sense in your environment. A lot of people assume that design is just a visual thing. It's not. It's all of your senses. And when you start taking those things into account, you're going to be a much richer designer.